Last week in Geneva, Switzerland, the most important scientific discovery of the 21st century was announced. Here is the CBS Evening News with Scott Pelley's story on the announcement. It's not often a scientific breakthrough gets sung about. But the workers at the world's largest atom smasher are singing about the Higgs boson particle, the so-called God particle that's been the holy grail in the world of physics for almost 50 years. Ever since Peter Higgs, now 83, theorized that the particle must exist in order for the universe and everything in it to hold together, to have what the physicists call mass. Without Higgs boson, there would be no stars, no planets, no us. So at the Large Hadron Collider on the French-Swiss border, they've been blasting bits of atoms at each other and measuring the even tinier bits the collisions produce. As a layman, I would now say, I think we have it. Rolf Hoyer, the project's director, announced the results to an appreciative audience of scientists. Though they couldn't say they'd positively found the Higgs boson particle itself, they could say they found one that walks and talks like one, and maybe it. Peter Higgs himself looked satisfied, his theory vindicated. For me, it's really an incredible thing that it's happened in my lifetime. The challenge now is to explain what it means. Professor Heinz Wolf has been trying to explain science for decades. He even devised a machine to blast meat pies at each other to demonstrate what an atom smasher does. <laughs> so what does the discovery mean for us? If you're the lady in the supermarket, it isn't going to make any difference to you. It's really a big cultural step. Other than that the supermarket wouldn't be there unless this... <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, we'll wait the supermarket or mass the supermarket. The supermarket exists and the universe exists. And now these people believe they found the tiny particle that provides the cosmic glue that holds it all together. The discovery opens doors to the next frontier of understanding the universe. Scientists at the Large Hadron Collider in Geneva discovered a new subatomic particle. It is likely the long-sought Higgs boson, which is the key to understanding the existence of mass and matter. The search for the elusive particle began over four decades ago when physicists first proposed the theory in 1964. Joining me now for this breakthrough conversation, two physicists from Columbia. Brian Greene is widely credited for groundbreaking discoveries in the field of string theory. And Michael Tutts, he is one of the scientists involved in the experiment at the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, Switzerland. I am pleased to have both of them at this table. The world knows this is important. We just got it. We don't quite know because it is about things so fundamental like mass and matter and understanding it, yet at the same time it is so complex, you know, because of how it was discovered. And give us a primer on this. Well, as you said, about 40 years ago, a puzzle arose in physics, which is where do the fundamental particles, like electrons and quarks, where do they get the mass, the heft that experiment reveals them to have? Now, mass is the resistance an object offers to having its speed change. If you take a baseball, when you throw it, your arm feels the resistance. A shot put, you feel that resistance. Right. Similarly for particles, where does the resistance come from? And the theory was put forward that perhaps space is filled with an invisible stuff an invisible molasses-like stuff. And when, when the particles try to move through the molasses, they feel a resistance, a stickiness. Yeah. And it's that stickiness which is where their mass comes from. That but creates mass. That, or... Exactly, that creates the mass. But the question is, how would you ever know if this invisible stuff is real? And that's what the experiments have established now. How would you know that this invisible stuff, which is now called... Higgs field. Higgs field. Yes. Is real. Right. Now, why couldn't they find, why couldn't they prove it was real? Well, we think we may have finally done that, but it took a long journey because it's an elusive, invisible stuff. You don't see it. You have to find some way to access it. And the proposal, which now seems to bear fruit, is if you slam protons together, other particles, at very, very high speed, which is what happens at the Large Hadron Collider. And they can only collider. do that at a collider like this. Exactly. So you slam the particles together at very high speed, and you can sometimes jiggle this invisible molasses, sometimes flick out a little speck of this molasses, which would be a Higgs particle. So people have looked for that little speck of a particle. 
And now there's evidence that it has been found. So when we mean matter, we mean like you and me, and, and, and we mean this table and this cup and this glass and yes. this pen. The fundamental particles making up that matter would have their mass from this interaction with the Higgs field, the molasses. And how big is this idea? It's a huge one. It's at the centerpiece of what's known as the standard model of particle physics, which is a, an equation that people have developed over many decades that we have been using to predict what would happen at colliders around the world. Every experimental result can be explained using this standard model of particle physics with the one missing piece of the puzzle being this Higgs field, this Higgs particle. That's the one that we've needed to finish this story. So now that we have that, everybody's convinced we have that, correct? That, well, we don't yet know that it's exactly the standard model Higgs, but we've certainly found a new particle, and it begins to smell like a Higgs, so we'll see over the course of the next few months. And what doors does it open to us? Well, uh, as, as Brian said, it, it is the thing that explains to us how our fundamental particles got mass, and it is a piece of the puzzle, and now that we have this, we can move on from here. And maybe it isn't even a standard model Higgs. Maybe it's something more exotic. Mm. That remains to be seen. Now, what would be another big question that this might help us answer? Well, there are a number of, uh, of questions. One of the questions that we depending on what it is. But uh, if it is uh, a standard model Higgs, well, we're trying to understand what is beyond the standard model. What, what might be there after this? So here we can put this together now and say that this is we, our understanding. We've got this understanding, but what's next? And, and there might be many different things like supersymmetry, uh, ideas from string theory, and so forth. Why do they call it God's particle? Um, well, at least the, the anecdote that I heard uh, from uh, Leon Letterman wrote a book. Right, the Nobel uh, laureate. Nobel laureate, uh, particle physicist. Uh, he wrote a book called The God Particle, and it was about this Higgs uh, boson. Uh, and why did he say it was a God particle? Why did he use that well, reference? Well, what, what I heard, the way the story goes, was that he initially wanted to call it, because we've been looking for it for so many years, he wanted to call it the goddamn particle. Because <laughs> uh, it was then, so elusive. It's so elusive. And then his editor said, no, maybe not. Uh, yeah. So the God particle. And then the reason for that, of course, it has no religious connotations. Right. But it simply says that, like uh, Brian indicated, that you get... The elementary particles acquire their mass this way. If the electron had no mass, we wouldn't be able to put together atoms, and we wouldn't be here talking. So in that yeah, sense. And what's great about this story, as you and I mentioned sitting down, Higgs was there in the room. And what does that mean to a scientist? Yeah, I mean, for most people, science is a body of facts that you learn in the classroom. It's cold, hard description of nature. When in reality, it's a living, breathing entity with real human beings that go out on a limb making proposals, making calculations. And Higgs went out on a big limb many years ago. This was a crazy, in wild 64? idea. In 64, yeah. yeah. 64, 68, people were developing these as other scientists too. But imagine doing a calculation on a piece of paper and proposing it as a fundamental new feature of the universe, this invisible stuff that was out there. At first, the paper was rejected from the journal to which he submitted it. Nobody believed this idea at first. Slowly, people began to say, yeah, this has legs. And then for him to be in the room when they find the particle, oh. he, 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 I, I, I could see him wiping away a tear when, when the announcement and finally came And so would you and through. so would I. Of course, because yeah. there's a and drama to this kind of was, discovery. It was pretty spectacular because... Uh, normally, when you listen to a scientific seminar, physics seminar, people listen politely, and at the end, there's some applause. Here, there was spontaneous applause in the middle of the presentation. That's, I mean, for a physics presentation, that's completely unheard of. Yeah. So it was really astonishing. So, so where are we? I mean, the same question I asked, but a larger question. Where are we going? What is we going to find out about what it means to live in this universe and what this universe is all about? And you know, these big questions. Those are big questions, and they are the questions that make us get up in the morning and yeah. go work at our desks. And, and one of the things that this discovery has done for us is this. Our work as theoretical physicists, Mike actually builds these yeah. experiments, but we theorists, we do calculations, we do mathematical manipulations, and most of the time what we do is wrong. Not that it, we make a mistake, it's just not relevant to the universe. So the whole question of which math is the right math to follow? And the fact that the math that yields the Higgs particle 
is potentially now confirmed yeah. gives us confidence because we use yeah, that right, same right, math right, right. all the time. So yes, we want to understand how the universe got started and things like that, and perhaps these kinds of ideas will yeah, play a role. There's a big question, yes. how the universe gets started. Yes, and well, here's the amazing thing. So our best theory of how it got started, it's called inflationary cosmology, right. and it posits that the universe early on was filled with a little amount of field very much like the Higgs field. We call it the inflaton field. But its properties are very similar to the field that may now have been confirmed through experiments, with this field having the capacity to create a repulsive gravitational push that would drive the universe to expand. So if the Higgs particle is real, if it really has been confirmed, right. as the experiment suggests, so, then maybe we're on the right track for this other bigger question. Uh, and we'll come back to that. So what do we have to do to prove that everything we need to know about the Higgs? So one of the things is that uh, what our th theorist friends tell us and what we predict is the way after you produce a Higgs particle, let's imagine yeah. that you do, yeah. it decays in different possible ways, that uh, it could decay into different classes of elementary particles. And so what we do in the experiment, right, is we look for uh, these kinds of decays. And they also tell us how often it should decay into various different kinds of particles. And so the thing that we want to do is to actually confirm if this is the particle that we expected from theory, is that it behaves that way. In other words, it has the right kind of decay properties. It decays with the probability that is what we expected. It gets produced with the probability that we expected. So if all of those signs are right, and, and it, has a part of, it has another property called spin, and you'd like to understand if that's mm -hmm. correct as well. So there are a number of properties that we need to check, and All that's right. going to happen. I want to come back to the universe. What, what's your definition of the universe? All there is. Now, All there is. Now, that is an, a word that has undergone some change yeah. of late because many of our cutting-edge theories, which would be beyond the standard right. model, some suggest that what we long thought to be everything may be a small part of an even grander whole to which we now have the name multiverse. Mm. So this is highly speculative ideas, but it could be that our reality is part of something even vaster. And, and what does string theory have to do with all this? Well, string theory is an attempt to put into the standard model something that it's missing. So the standard model of particle physics, it's, a, it's in a formula that really fits on a t-shirt. In fact, Charlie, I brought one of those for you right here. So here is the standard model of particle physics right, yeah, right there. there. So the first line describes three of nature's four forces mathematically. Right. The strong nuclear force, the weak nuclear force, and the electromagnetic force. The bottom line, that's the Higgs field. That's the missing piece. But there's ah. something else that's missing in this equation, which is the force of gravity. Yeah. So where does gravity fit into the story? It's very hard to put gravity into that formula. String theory is one of our best hopes for melding that equation, the standard model, with gravity into one unified whole. This dream that Einstein had of, of a single theory oh, that would describe everything. That's exactly everything. what I was thinking about. So I mean, tell me about a single theory of everything. Yeah. That, that, did he die believing there was a theory of everything? More than that, I mean, he was on his deathbed in Princeton in 1955 in the hospital in Princeton, New Jersey. He asked for the pad of paper on which he had been scribbling equations in the desperate hope that even in the final minutes of his life, he would complete was... this journey. That's the drama of science, and he didn't find the unified theory. A theory that tells you it all fits together. Yes, it shows how all of nature's forces work, all of matter, yeah, in one this, consistent yeah, package. Stephen Hawking used to work on this, too, didn't he? Does. Yeah, no, I think he made a bet that the Higgs wasn't going, wasn't there, oh. and it was a hundred bucks or something like right. this. And he lost the bet. He acknowledged he lost, he lost the, bet. the bet. That's right. So, what are the other big questions that that are out there, though? I mean, excite me about physics. Sure. So, another great discovery that's probably in some way related to this, which happened about a dozen years ago, is that we've known for a long time that the universe is expanding. Right. It's getting bigger and bigger over time. But everybody thought that the expansion would be slowing down. It's like if you throw up a baseball into the air, it goes up, but it goes up slower and slower because gravity pulls right, it right, back. Right. We thought that the gravitational pull of each galaxy on every other would also slow the expansion. So a couple of teams of astronomers went out to measure the rate of slowdown, and lo and behold, they found that it's not slowing down. It's speeding up, like you take the ball and you throw it up, and it goes up faster and faster. So the big mystery is what's pushing the universe apart? And one of the possibilities is a Higgs-like field, another invisible substance filling space that can give an outward push that would explain this remarkable, surprising discovery of the accelerated expansion. So when expansion. are we going to find this, Michael? 
Well, uh, that's a good question. Uh, we're not going to actually find it, but there is another piece. So the thing Brian was talking about might be like 70%, 75% of the universe. The stuff that you and I are made of, yeah. we're kind of 4% of the universe. Mm -hmm. Now this, you, me. But there's another kind of 20% or so that's called dark matter. Right. And we don't know what, we know it's out there, we just don't know what it is. Yeah, okay, I, I've heard of dark matter before, I have no right. idea what it is. And, and one possibility is that some of these particles, perhaps, if supersymmetry exists, and perhaps the lightest one of those particles might be the stuff of dark matter. So that would be pretty exciting. And we're, you know, we're looking very hard for things like the existence of supersymmetry and see if we find evidence for that. Yeah. So that's certainly one of the directions in which we're going. Now, all, uh, the experimentations in physics is throughout the world. Everywhere it's going, it's taking place everywhere. There's a general sort of worldwide push to answer these questions. Yeah, well... Or is it located more here than there. So the, the problem is, for example, why did it take so long to find the Higgs? Yeah. One of the reasons it took so long is that it weighs about 120 times more than a proton. Yeah. So it's, it's one, it's really very heavy. And the way these, these machines work, what we do is when we collide these particles together, it takes the energy that you had of this motion and uses Einstein's E equals MC squared to take the energy, the E, into M, the mass. And so you create new particles. Among them, you hope, is, for example, the Higgs particle. Mm. So the thing you needed was an accelerator with enough energy, and you needed, because it's very rare, so you needed enough collisions. So we collide, for example, when it runs, a, hundred, a bunch of 100 billion protons is passing through another bunch of 100 billion protons, and there are 1,000 bunches in this accelerator. So you need lots and lots of collisions to see these very rare processes. You know, there was this notion that coming out of CERN was this experiment that suggested that there was something faster than the speed of light. Yes. Then my, my sense is they backtracked from Yes, that. that's correct. And when that was announced, it was startling, but most physicists said... Really startling. Yeah, most Very. physicists said, we don't believe it. You know, we, you know, whenever you challenge Einstein, It'll get a lot of attention, but it also yeah. requires a lot of evidence before so you try to top them. So what mistake did they make? I mean, well, did, apparently, were they maybe, serious people? Yeah, they were serious oh, people, yeah. and these are hard experiments to do. I mean, they were sending these neutrinos through solid rock, which you can easily pass through from, yeah. from Geneva to Grand Sasso in Italy, right. and finding that it was getting there 60 nanoseconds early. That's 60 billionths of a second over yeah. 400 miles. That's a very <laughs> tough measurement. Yes, that's a hard one. They found, I believe, that one of their fiber optic cables had a a little bit of a problem, which so when corrected, the results seem to have gone away. I offered to eat my hat when, uh, when you heard this. Did you really? Yeah, you know, you can Fortunately, know. I didn't. So there, you, yes, I can see. So you're you're saying that you believe that there's nothing will be discovered that will suggest there's something that's faster than the speed of light. So far, Einstein's uh, predictions have been spot on. But are there a bunch of people trying to prove that Einstein was wrong oh, on that? As experimentalists, when, when our friends tell us something, the first thing we should do is why and try and understand it and try and yeah. check it and, and push the boundaries and well, see So do you believe there's something faster than the speed of light? I don't. I mean, Einstein's special theory of relativity is really in good shape, and there doesn't seem to be any evidence that yeah. it'll fail at the experiments that at least that we can achieve at the Large Hadron Collider and beyond. But one thing that really really needs to be emphasized is finding the Higgs particle may complete a certain chapter in our search oh. to understand nature. But we are even more excited when new things happen that are completely unexpected. So if you were to ask me, what would I like to have happen at the Large Hadron Collider next? Yes. I'd like something completely crazy to happen, something unexpected, something that makes us go back to the drawing board and say, holy moly, and rework the equations <laughs> yes. and come to a deeper understanding at the end. That's, that, I mean, that's yeah. exactly what we want to do, is we want to send our friends back to the drawing board and discover yeah. something that totally unexpected. And there is this. I mean, you've got size now in terms of computers that give you computational abilities you've never had before and more, more likely to lead to discoveries we could not imagine. Is that a fair statement? Uh, that's a fair statement. W when we do the analysis for our experiment, my, my experiment happens to be called ATLAS. There's another very large one called CMS. We have in the order of uh, 100,000 computers worldwide that are used to analyze the data that comes from these trillions of collisions that we see. So without them, we couldn't do it. Hmm. Absolutely. It's an exciting time, isn't it? Yeah. You know, and who knows, maybe... 
there's a possibility of finding maybe little black yeah. holes at the Large Hadron Collider, I mean, unexpected particles. Right. And the this the is thing is that we're at a new energy regime. We've never been a yeah. new this, energy regime. In other words, this is the highest energy accelerator in the world. It's, oh. it's, it's now four times higher than the previous one, which was a place called Fermilab, Right. which just uh, shut down last year. We will be going to 13 or 14 trillion electron volts, which will, uh, we're at eight now, and we'll be going to 13 or 14. So this is completely unexplored territory. I mean, this is, this is Columbus heading out into the ocean, yeah. and we hope to see something. Now, have part of scientific discoveries happened when people were in search of something else? Many of them. Yeah, and you find out along right. the journey sure. exactly. that exactly. Th this other thing is more remarkable. Yes, and that's the serendipity of science. And, you know, when I talk to kids about science and try to give them a sense of that journey of discovery, that's yeah. what it's about. I mean, as Mike said, you head out into the unknown bravely and figure out what's there. It used to be believed that the United States, because of its great universities and other factors, uh, so many people, immigrants from other places, came here to study and stayed and became parts of, of great research projects that we've lost some of that edge. Is that a fair statement or at least a concern? It's a concern, I think. I mean, for example, we're still a major part of, of the uh, LHC and, and CERN. Right, right. Our experiment has 20 percent or so U.S., and the other experiment has 30-plus percent. Right. So we're certainly in, in a key point. But they're actually now, as of the time that the uh, Fermilab accelerator shut down, there are no uh, native... U.S. based uh, accelerators. And so it's hard. And there was to, a time, in fact, they were going to build it here, wasn't there? Or some, there, was some... there was going to be something called the Superconducting exactly Super Collider, right. which would have been built in killed. Texas. It was killed, uh, indeed. Indeed, it was yeah. killed by Congress. And so, yeah, that's a concern. I mean, what I think the important point, right, to realize is that not only are these inspiring ideas and critical, but kind of the basic research of today is the technology of tomorrow. So, mm -hmm. you know, whatever, 20 years, 40 years, 50 years from now, what we're doing now and you think of as basic research will be, I think, the technology that people will take for granted at that time. If this doesn't make you excited about science, nothing will. I mean, it is an extraordinary sense. Uh, and uh, as in so much of science, all the benefits of it, you know, that's, that, that is an unfolding drama. The yes. benefits. Of and I yep. think quantum mechanics itself is a great story. If you interviewed the people developing quantum mechanics in the 20s and 30s and said, what is this good for? I suspect they'd say, I don't know. We're talking about molecules, atoms, very far from everyday life. But 80 years later, the fact that you have a cell phone or many cell phones or a personal computer or medical technology that has an integrated circuit, it all relies on quantum physics. People have calculated something like 35% of the gross national product comes from quantum physics, which is just to say that so basic... 25, 30, about 35%. Now, whether that's exactly accurate, I don't know, but a lot of it. Yeah. So the fact is, basic research over the course of many decades, it starts with trying to understand things, but then it allows us to manipulate things, and that yields things that affect daily life in a very profound way. So I guarantee in the future it will absolutely, this, the basic research we do today is going to be fundamental for them. Mike. And it also inspires people because I a silly anecdote. I was having my hair cut uh, yesterday and someone said, the hairdresser said, uh, so what were you doing on 4th of July? I said, I was a little busy. I was up late. And she said, really? I, what, you working? I said, no, you may have seen in the news. She said, oh, the God particle. <laughs> <laughs> so when your hairdresser knows about yeah. that. So we hate the name God particle, right. but man, but it's well, a good it, PR it, it, point. Oh, yeah. <laughs> if people know what you're talking about. Yes, they right. may not understand it, but they know something important happened exactly. and they exactly. called it the God particle. Right. Exactly right. Michael, thank you. Great to have you here. Thank Our you. Pleasure. Pleasure. Thank you. Great to see you as always. We'll be right back. Stay with us.